Okay, so our pre-launch uh, segment here, we're gonna start off with uh, AV and mitral valve uh, structure and function. And uh, Jason Tibbetts gonna start, and he's from uh, Scott & Wyden, he's the associate uh, program director for the residency up there. Okay, so we spent uh, the morning talking about hemodynamic function, coagulopathy, cardiopulmonary bypass. We're gonna get into a little bit of normal aortic valve and mitral valve anatomy. So the first question is, why do we even need to know this? Um, so we've been studying this, most of us, for probably the better part of a decade. Um, in order to adequately repair abnormal function, we've got to know what normal anatomy and normal function is, and so we'll take a few minutes to review uh, the anatomy that we learned in first year of medical school. So the aortic valve is a tri-leaflet, hopefully tri-leaflet valve. Uh, abnormal anatomy can include uh, bi-leaflet, unicuspid, even quadricuspid valves. Uh, but it's considered a semilunar valve, which is similar to the pulmo pulmonic valve. Uh, they have a similar embryo embryologic development, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, normal valve area ranges between 2.5 to 3.5. Some texts say 3 to 4 centimeters squared. Uh, it's important to know about the anatomy of the aortic valve because of its central location in the heart. Uh, it touches all the other chambers and valves in the heart. So when we have dysfunction of this valve, particularly, for example, if we have endocarditis, it affects more than just that valve. So uh, if you guys can read this, this is uh, the embryology of development of both the pulmonic and mitral valve. Let's see if we can have a pointer pop up here, perfect. So you start with a left and right bulbar ridge embryologically developing, and those uh, form outpouchings towards the center, which eventually go on uh, to have fused bulbar ridges. Um, and during this time, you also have uh, subvalvular swelling that eventually will become the leaflets of the valve. Uh, as development continues, you have an anterior cusp of the pulmonic valve as you begin to have the other two leaflet forms uh, formed posteriorly, and you also have uh, the leaflets of the aortic valve forming as well. Eventually, they have their own discrete fibrous rings uh, that form around both the left and right, uh, excuse me, around both the uh, pulmonic and aortic valves uh, with the left, right, and non-coronary or posterior cusp of the aortic valve forming eventually. And so let's talk about the divisions of the aortic valve. So let's see if I can get this to play on a loop. Not really. That's okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, it still shows the function. So this is a mid-esophageal aortic valve long axis view from a TTE uh, performed intraoperatively. Uh, what I want you to see from this is the relationship of the aortic valve to the left atrium the left ventricle, and also the right ventricle. You can see all of those structures in this picture. And so the aortic valve is intimately related to all these different structures within the heart. Um, we have uh, multiple components of the aortic valve complex or the aortic valve root, uh, starting with the arteroventricular junction. So the transition zone essentially from uh, the ventricle, the left ventricle into the aorta. And we get to the aortic root, uh, which is composed of the aortic annulus, or the AV junction. We have the leaflets of the aortic valve, which again are the non-coronary left and right coronary cusps. We have the sinus of Valsalva, which is basically an outpouching of the ascending aorta, which is where our coronary arteries take off. And we also have, distal to that, the sinotubular junction, which is the transition point from the sinus of Valsalva, which is a ridge typically seen in uh, human anatomy uh, transitioning to the ascending aorta. And here's a cartoon depiction of some of that anatomy. So this is uh, an aortic valve or aortic root uh, transected uh, between the left and right coronary cusps. And you can see that these valves are sort of, that these leaflets of the valve are sort of parachute shaped and that their insertion is actually not in a straight line. So when you look at a uh, depiction of an aortic root and you divide out the segments, uh, typically we've seen it depicted where we have a straight line as the aortoventricular junction, but in reality, that's not a straight line. It's sort of a, a looping U shape uh, with the commissures of each of the valves forming together uh, to form sort of a, a crown-like uh, appearance of this valve. And again, you see uh, the notation of the names for, for the cusp leaflets, uh, which are associated with the coronary arteries. We have the right coronary artery coming off here, our non-coronary or posterior 
uh, aortic valve cusp, and then our left coronary cusp and uh, left coronary artery coming off here. Uh, beneath the mitral valve, again, we saw our prior picture where uh, the aortic valve is intimately related to all of the other components of the heart. We have our mitral valve leaflets uh, cut in this cro cross section just below, and you can see there are cortical attachments uh, headed out over here into the left ventricle. Uh, depicting this picture, you can also see uh, the bundle of Hiss uh, in its uh, posterior location. which is important to know for uh, aortic valve repair or replacement. So here's a, a picture again of uh, the crown-like structure of the uh, aortic annulus. So the insertion of the leaflets is here. And so if you were to be asked before coming to this lecture, if you were like me and somebody asked me, okay, define the annulus of the aortic valve, I'd have been like, okay, the annulus is the green line or maybe it's the yellow line, but it's probably the green line. Uh, but in fact, it's the red, uh, is the aortic valve annulus, uh, which loops up and down. Um, and again, here in the same picture, this is the same uh, cut as our last picture. We have our aortomitral curtain coming down over here. Uh, beneath this is our uh, bundle of Hiss, so our conducting system is intimately related to our aortic valve. And up above we have our sinotubular junction, uh, which is a, a ridge of tissue which uh, delineates the sinus of Valsalva from the ascending aorta. Uh, so this is a, a picture. These two images are not exactly correlated, so uh, don't, don't be confused. So this is a mid-esophageal aortic valve short axis view. Uh, depicting the aortic valve, which is a tri-leaflet valve, uh, which is described as uh, a Mercedes sign with normal anatomy uh, when you have proper coaptation of the tri-leaflet valve. Uh, and in its open maximal position, it is typically triangular shaped. So when uh, trying to determine the uh, aortic valve area, or orifice area. Uh, there's a couple different methods you can use to determine that, but one of them is planimetry, which is probably not the best way to do it, but uh, if you can get an adequate cut, typically best done with 3D echocardiography, uh, its shape is typically triangular with maximal opening of these leaflets. And again, the picture on the right is a depiction of uh, the aortic valve in its central location, intimately related to all the other valves uh, with its uh, fibrous uh, ring connecting uh, the mitral and aortic uh, valve posterior to the non-coronary cusp of the uh, aortic valve uh, connected to the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And again, the intimate association of our conducting system here. And like Dr. Herrera was mentioning in her earlier talk, which is a perfect segue into normal anatomy of the left heart valves, uh, you've got opening of the mitral valve during diastole, filling of the left ventricle, uh, and during systole, uh, because of the vortices in the left ventricle, you have optimized flow out of the left ventricular outflow tract through hopefully a competent uh, and non-stenotic aortic valve in normal conditions. However, we'll spend the next couple of lectures, I think, talking about abnormal anatomy of, of all of these valves. And like she also mentioned earlier, uh, Leonardo da Vinci is one of the first people to spend a significant amount of time contributing to medical knowledge uh, concerning the function of the aortic valve. His studies were actually done 500 years ago uh, and looked at the flow of fluid uh, through the aortic valve. He postulated that there were vortices formed because of the outpouching of the sinus of Valsalva, which you can see down here. <laughs> And you can also see here. So one of the principal theories uh, that he postulated was that uh, the aortic valve, uh, which when it opens, it begins to open centrally uh, at the cusp leaflets, so not at the tips. But when it closes, it starts to close just before um, end systolic blood flow. So blood flow is still going forward, but you actually start to have coaptation of the aortic valve leaflets because of these eddy currents are uh, vortices that are formed that form pressure that pushes back on the tips of these aortic valve leaflets. And so you actually have coaptation beginning of the leaflets before the end of systole, which is an, an interesting idea. <laughs> 
Now we'll move on to the mitral valve. So the mitral valve is composed of four different components. So you have the, the leaflets, anterior and posterior. You have the annulus of the mitral valve, uh, which, as our prior speakers have noted, is a dynamic uh, annulus, uh, as the aortic valve annulus is as well. Uh, you also have the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscles. So here is a mid-esophageal four-chamber view focusing in on the mitral valve, um, which shows abnormal coaptation of the valve in this, uh, this picture. You can actually see we have a, a flail segment of our posterior leaflet in this one. But the purpose of it is just to show that you should have coaptation uh, of the leaflet tips uh, to prevent flow of blood uh, up into the left atrium uh, during systole. And here's a 3D image which shows our anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets. Those are so named because of their location in the heart, anterior, obviously being anterior, and posterior being posterior. What I'd like you to note on this image here is the scalloping of the posterior leaflet. So you have in this image uh, two commissures, an anterior lateral and a posterior medial commissure posterior medial commissure, but you also have scallops of this posterior leaflet, uh, which are named P1, P2, and P3 when moving from anterior lateral to posterior medial. Uh, the corresponding structures on the anterior leaflet, which you notice are smooth and non-scalloped, but just named because they uh, correspond with uh, the adjoining portion of the posterior leaflet, are A1, A2, and A3. Um, the surface area of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is large enough uh, to fill uh, the entire uh, orifice area of an open uh, mitral valve uh, during diastole. However, that being said, the surface area of the posterior leaflet and also its circumference around the valve uh, uh, diameter is even larger than the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And here's another 3D image. Uh, anybody want to take a guess? Is this normal or abnormal anatomy? Anybody want to throw a guess out? Totally normal, right? No, okay, somebody's going to shake their head no. No, totally abnormal. Uh, this is supposed to be a normal anatomy talk, right? Sorry, guys, threw a curveball. Um, but uh, <laughs> so this is a flail P2 segment. So we have our anterior leaflet up top here. We have an A1, A2, A3, and we have a corresponding P1, P2, which you can see this little knuckle of tissue keep flipping up into the image, and P3 over on the right. Normally when the mitral valve coapse, you have a significant overlap of the tissue because you, as I mentioned earlier, the actual surface area of the leaflets of the valve is uh, extensive enough to where you have a significant portion of the valve overlapping with each uh, cardiac cycle. So it actually takes pretty significant dysfunction, either dilation or papillary muscle dysfunction before you start to see significant mitral regurgitation. So there's a built-in um, uh, a built-in protective amount of extra tissue where you have uh, a coaptation point um, which is actually a few millimeters thick uh, where that valve can stand to dilate a little bit um, without having significant mitral regurgitation. Let's see if we can get this to advance. I broke the internet. There we go. All right, so this busy slide uh, has labeled all the different anatomy of uh, the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve, aortic, pulmonic valve. We're not gonna go through everything, but again, just wanted to show you uh, the names of the uh, cusps of the uh, anterior and posterior leaflets of the mitral valve and where they're actually located in the heart. So anterior lateral commissure, posterior medial commissure. Uh, the anatomy makes sense when you see it in this picture. Uh, you have your P1, P2, P3, and the corresponding A1, A2, and A3. Um, you have intimate association here between your uh, left and non-coronary cusp of your aortic valve associated with a uh, fibrous ring in between uh, the aortic valve and the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. 
The other thing that uh, this picture really points out nicely is that you have fibrous reinforcement of the mitral annulus all throughout, uh, essentially from the anterior lateral commissure, just anterior to the anterior lateral commissure, all the way around posterior to the posterior lateral commissure. However, this portion, the posterior leaflet, specifically P1, P2 area, is not supported by any other fiber structure. This is all just free wall of the left ventricle. And so if you're gonna have dilation um, and perhaps a flail or a prolapse segment of your mitral valve, it's most common and most typical that you have a P2, maybe a P1. Uh, and this is why, because there's no fibrous reinforcement posteriorly of this mitral valve. And so this is the area that tends to dilate first. Not to say that you can't have dilation of uh, the anterior portion of the mitral annulus, but typically you see it here first. So the mitral valve structure and function, it's complex anatomy, and it's not just leaflets. You'll have the annulus of the mitral valve, uh, which is a dynamic structure which moves during the cardiac cycle during systole and diastole. You have the papillary muscles of the posterior medial and anterior lateral. You have the chordae, both, or excuse me, all three primary, secondary, and tertiary, and their unique insertion sites. So the mitral valve has been described as uh, looking like the miter of, uh, of a pope. Um, also uh, been described as uh, the actual valve itself having a saddle structure uh, or looking like a Pringle. Uh, you can see an inner peak span from posterior to anterior is the high point of the mitral valve with this being the anterior leaflet here and the posterior leaflet wrapping around here. So again, to orient us, P1, P2, P3. And then from lateral to medial, we have an intervalley span, which is usually about five centimeters in diameter with four centimeters in diameter anterior to posterior, posterior dimensions. And again, you have a fibroelastic ring that encircles the valve. Um, the dynamic nature of this valve, of the annulus moving in and out during systole and diastole improves coaptation of the mitral valve leaflets and also reduces stress on the mitral valve leaflets. Uh, the papillary muscles, uh, of which there are typically two, though there can be abnormal anatomy. Uh, you have an anterior lateral and a posterior medial. And from those uh, papillary muscles, you have the chordae tendinae, which are given off and insert in various points on the mitral valve. You can have primary cords, which insert on the distal tip of the uh, leaflets, the anterior and posterior leaflet. Um, the, called the rough zone of the mitral valve leaflets. Uh, you can also have secondary cords which insert more proximal uh, in the leaflet and you can have tertiary cords which typically actually insert from the uh, ventricular free wall into the papillary muscles themselves. And you typically see a single uh, papillary, excuse me, a single cord coming off of a papillary muscle which then tends to fan out and have multiple attachment sites on the mitral valve leaflet itself. And uh, the chordae tendinae themselves uh, are primarily composed of collagen um, and with some elastin. They do have a little bit of stretch in them. They can stretch about 10 to 20 percent uh, within the cardiac uh, cycle, but they tend to be somewhat rigid and fixed and give uh, the mitral valve its uh, structure uh, during the relaxation phase of the cardiac cycle. And how do we image the mitral valve and the aortic valve? Uh, there's a number of different techniques which we'll go over throughout the course of today. Transthoracic, transesophageal, uh, echocardiography, cardiac MRI, cardiac CT occasionally. Uh, so there's lots of different ways to evaluate uh, the structure and function of both uh, the aortic and mitral valve. And we'll talk more about that throughout the course of the day, but I'll cut it short for, for time's sake. All right, thank you.